hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Undisciplined. Today we are speaking to Professor Laurent de Souter. He's a professor of legal theory at the Fair Unimax State Brussels. We're talking about his two most recent English books, 2020's After Law, which came out with Polity Press, and 2022's Deleuze's Philosophy of Law, which came out with Edinburgh University Press. For the first time in a while, we're talking legal theory right in my wheelhouse, and I hope that you enjoy this episode. Enough talking, let's go. Thank you, Professor De Sitter, for speaking to me. I'm delighted. Today, I would really like to talk about your two quite recent books. The one is After Law, and the other one is uh, Deleuze's Philosophy of Law, which is not a new book, but very recently released in English for the first time. But first, I want to start a bit with After Law. Now, just as a bit of a background, there's this thing that I heard Gunther Teubner said, where he said, a lot of people miss or don't realize what uh, outstanding cultural achievement the law is. And this came into my mind as I was reading After Law, because you give this very broad overview of the development of law across the world and across history. I think the book is quite unique in this aspect. So just to start with, why did you feel it was necessary or what inspired you to take such a broad temporal and spatial view of the law? Well, um, well, first, uh, thank you for the nice words um, and the invitation. I'm, 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 I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk about these books because I haven't had much uh, uh, for the moment because they were all, both, you know, released in the midst of, of you know, of well, after law slightly before, but but uh, the the Deleuze book in the midst of this, you know, current you know pandemic thing, which uh, has changed so much for so many of us. Um, but after law was 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 a was a um, you know was a bizarre endeavor. Uh, it was the end for me of let's say the long crisis uh, that was my relationship to law. The fact is that I'm you know I'm a professor of legal theory and I'm I'm a lawyer, but I'm one of those lawyers that became lawyers for bad reasons and probably one also who became a lawyer, a bad lawyer, actually. So, so eventually I tried desperately to escape it, but I ended up having a PhD in law and continuing doing things without, um, you know, almost, uh, without my own intervention, you know, and, and, and I say so because, because I think that for the very first minute I entered law school, I hated law so passionately, um, everything of it, you know, um, I find it boring, dull, pretentious, uh, I couldn't stand um, the, the the type of attitude that my professors had. You know, this type of the law is what is going to you know save us all from evil and chaos and blah blah blah. Um, the, the, this this kind of also prophetic stance. Now we talk when we talk about law, we are talking about grand things and important things, whereas others are not as grand or as important, so on and so forth. So I hated it. I hated it all. And 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 for a large, you know, the largest part of my of my, you know, academic career, the, the, the beginning, you know, the time of my PhD and and my, my postdocs and so on and so forth, I was really, it was really about for me finding ways to avoid it, to avoid law as such, and and so I devoted lots of you know efforts and energy into either you know law and literature or, or, or you know. Uh, Acquainting myself with critical legal studies and critical legal studies circle, postmodern jurisprudence, all that stuff. We're speaking, you know, late 1990s, early two th- years, you know, early 2000s. And mostly all the places where I could say either bad things about law or speak about law in terms that were very foreign or very remote to its reality. And, and indeed, you know, one of the challenges, of course, was and still is for everybody, you know, the, 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 the uh, the dominance of, of of legal positivism in in law schools uh, around the world, under the more you know there are more modern faces as, such as empirical legal studies or, or such as law and economics, but it's it's mostly you know positivism all over again. At least as a mindset, maybe not as a, as a set of theoretical beliefs or values or claims, but at uh, at least as a mindset. So it was about fighting all this. 
um, but without having anything to offer in return. You know, it was about destroying that or deconstructing it or criticizing or whatever. But but I had no positive view to offer about law. And and it's the meeting with with Bruno Latour when I was doing my my PhD because I I did my PhD in, you know in very close relationship with Bruno Latour, Isabel Stengers, and my of course my my supervisor uh, Professor Serge Utwirt from the uh, Vrije University of Brussel. And it's through the reading of of the last chapter of this amazing book of Bruno Latour. Uh, the, 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 in English, it could be I don't know if it's a fabric of law, the making of law. Uh, in French, it's, fabric it's of the law. making of law. Yeah, the making of law. Amazing, extraordinary, extraordinary book. Whose last chapter suddenly opened opened up a series of possibilities that, as a lawyer, I felt that I was unable to even think of you know it was uh, it was i was i was uh, especially coming from the french speaking world where the lawyers are even more conservative than, than than in other parts of the world it was you know there are things that you can't even think of saying and and some of the things you know i've i found some you know connections with what bruno was saying and 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 suddenly from from there to try and think of a, the possibility to say something about law which is which could be positive, positive not simply in the sense of being nice, but positive in the sense of asserting a form of existence or specificity or, or peculiarity or, or, or even why not essence or truth or whatever about law became again something uh, utterable at least. And, 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 and that then you know, made me change path and, and I, I reread very carefully Deleuze at the time who added some more information and ideas about that. I, I had this encounter with, with some legal historians, the most important of which is the late uh, Yann Thomas, a French legal historian extraordinaire who did, who did you know, pieces of research that are just you know, groundbreaking and, 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 and eye-opening on so many grounds and so many concepts uh, that we still use today uh, in the world of law, but seen through the lens of Roman law. So... So all this, you know, led me to a reconsideration of, of something that could be less, you know, reactive and less angry about law. And uh, what I came up with uh, somehow and that gave birth eventually to, to after law was, of course, a distinction. A distinction that Jan Thomas has formulated very often and that is actually a very important distinction and a very complicated distinction to to formulate and, and also to manipulate uh, in English, which is the distinction between law and law. Uh, it seems it might sound absurd mm. uh, said in English, but every other Indo-European languages, from French to Italian, from German to, uh, to Spanish, Portuguese, whatever, they all have a distinction, which is a very important distinction between law, let's say in Latin it would be use, and law, lex, you know, droit in French, Loi, mm. uh, diritto, legge, derecho, uh, uh, um, shit, I forgot, I forgot the Spanish for, for uh, lay, uh, recht und Gesetz uh, in German, uh, recht und Wett in, in Dutch, and so on and so forth. You know, there, there are all these distinctions that between the realm of what we could, we could call the legal or the normative and the realm of the juridical, which is not normative, but which is, let's say, more operational. Let's say, the, div the division within mm. law between everything that orders, allows, uh, prohibits, and so on and so forth. So mostly regulations, uh, 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 even contracts, why not? Norms, rules, laws, uh, constitutions, you know, judgments, and so on and so forth. And something else, which is actually what law is, if I can use, you know, this very problematic and complicated, of course, uh, uh, ontological statement, but something that is related to what law is, and that has nothing to do with all these, you know, normative aspects or the normative dimensions, which is how it functions, how it operates, through which categories, through which uh, mechanisms, so to speak, uh, it makes its effects somehow real. And we can think of lots of those operations, for instance, the idea of, of filiation or the idea of obligation and so on and so forth. There, there are a whole lot of operations that are very ancient that still constitute the basic architecture of contemporary law, you know, every day, the everyday life of law, but categories that have never, ever 
been either decided, created, uh, formed by any uh, normative instan instance, whether being legislators, judges, uh, and so on and so forth. But you take them away from the law and there is nothing. There is nothing left, or nothing left from this extraordinary, indeed, uh, uh, almost science fiction-like construction that is now uh, more than, than 2,500 years old. So what I wanted to do with After Law was, at the same time, going back to these roots and saying, OK, what happened at some point that allows for this possibility to happen? So the idea that some words uttered by some people at some at some, at some, you know, in some space and at a very particular time, were capable of producing very specific effects that could have uh, 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 very deep consequences in the actions of people, but not, but not only people, also non-humans and, and, and materials and, and even things that don't exist, but something that, that come into existence through law and so on and so forth. So I wanted to, I want, I wanted to come back to that and to show how of course, singular it was, also how misunderstood it was, precisely because of the confusion that is precisely the confusion that is shared by by lawyers from every you know uh, uh, every part of the of the of the spectrum, from the most critical to the most positivist, which is precisely that law equals law, so that you know the in, the totality of the uh, juridical world can be summarized by uh, the discourse or the analysis, the observation of the, let's say, the, 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 the legal tools, instruments, texts, and so on and so forth. The fact that the juridical and the legal will be one and the same thing. So I wanted to go mm -hmm. back to the roots, and I wanted also to go back to the moment or the problematic moment when, indeed, an overlap between the two started to appear and started to unfold. And what I wanted to do was not then to describe the whole story, which is a very long story of the fights between those who still wanted to cling to the idea that law is only about use, only about the juridical, only about these operations, and those who were mostly um, from the side of philosophers and very influenced by philosophers, especially by Greek philosophers, who said, no, 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 for law to be something else than a stupid, you know, system of case history, we need to um, govern it through a, a series of, of, of legal devices. And this, this is a very long story and a story that is not finished, hopefully, but a story that has seen undoubtedly the triumph of those who wanted to you know, affirm the primacy of the legal over the juridical. So I wanted to show that and I wanted to show what this primacy had you know, cast aside, the type of possibilities uh, that suddenly went were expelled from the picture and they were considered as absolutely irrelevant. And so I decided in the book to explore you know, all these traditions. Some of them are very ancient and completely have completely vanished, such as the ancient Egyptian tradition or the Mesopotamian traditions. Some are very ancient but still alive, like the rabbinic uh, uh, legal tradition or juridical tradition or the, um, you know, the, the Muslim legal tradition. And they all have devices and things, aspects, from which we could deeply learn if we wanted to go you know, to, 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 to go over uh, the many, many, many problems that everybody denounces today about the functioning of the Western, you know, post-Roman Greek uh, uh, juridical slash legal uh, system of, uh, of thought. So I wanted to, it was both a catalog of things forgotten, but things that were not simply antiquities there for the sake of curiosity, but things that we could maybe learn from and to try and go back to the roots of this divide, divide overlap between between the the the, the, the legal and the, and the juridical. So, I don't know. Maybe it was too much for one one single book, but but uh, I wanted to I wanted to try this, and I wanted to call it, it after law, even though most of the examples and the the, 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 the you know the domains that I explore are actually you know before uh, come from before law, mm. but which law? Uh, and, and that it's possible to to mm. play uh, to play with the title in English differently than it is in French or, or, or in other languages in which mm. the book had been translated. Um, but that was the basic intent, yes. Yeah, and it's interesting that you say it. It sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but then it, I believe you're correct. You say that it's exactly the philosophers who moved us away from 
how can you say the the jurisprudence to to law you know your uh, the instinctual feeling is that it should be the other way around but yeah yeah i know i know it's weird i know it's it's, it's weird and and you know it all started i i no no the pieces in my head started to 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 fall you know in the right place when I, I tried to also explain to myself the irritation that I had in reading, you know, some authors like Cicero, for instance. You know, lawyers love to quote Cicero um, because Cicero, you know, is, you know, the biggest, you know, uh, rhetorical figure, huge political figure too, considered a lawyer himself, was close friend to some of the most famous jurist consuls of his, of, of, of his time. He was even a pupil of one of the most important. So there's this kind of, you know, from Cicero to us, there is a continuum. We are the modern Cicero. You know, we modern lawyers, we are the modern Cicero and so on and so forth, the nobility. Mm. And so. But Cicero, I, I, I couldn't figure why, but he simply, every sentence from Cicero that I would read would piss me off. I would be irritated, you know. I would be irritated by the tone, mm. by the, 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 the self kind of self-aggrandizing, you know, uh, image that it gives to itself and, and the idea that, there's always a right solution, you know. He always comes up with with mm. with with a card out of his, of his sleeves and and a solution that is always nice and beautiful and 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 that gives a sort of you know a picture of both reconciliation and 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 heightened conscience to everything pertaining to political life and legal life. And at the same time, it never stops through in his discourses, etc., and the dialogues, uh, but also in his uh, properly, you know, legal or, or advocate discourses. Uh, he never stops criticizing lawyers, practicing lawyers or jurist consults or people deal with law. It's hard to know which term to use for Roman, you know, uh, from all these people who were interested in law but who were not either advocates or part of the legislative process or part of the government, but who were actually building up uh, these categories that we are, we are speaking of. So let's say jurist consults, even that is not completely proper, but anyway. And and uh, um, so he was always quarreling about them, saying that, no, it's 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 so bad. It's so very bad what they do. You know, they, they cut, you know, they split hair all the time. Um, they always, you know, get ourselves lost into technicalities. It's high time that we put order into that. And and there is this part, this passage of the De Legibus discourse, which is a not you know there are only some remnants of this discourse, which is very important, much more than the Officis, which is the one that is always quoted by by lawyers, but w which talks about basically you know the government. But in the, in the De Legibus, he speaks properly of of the rules of rules and, and, and of law, and and in this passage that I quote in in, in my book, he says, okay, now if we want to get rid of this disorder. And stop, um, you know, uh, finding ourselves stuck into the, the the swamp of legal technicalities. We need to order law through a series of very, you know, of abstract principles, and and principles that he says uh, are the principles of natural law. You know, the laws of nature, how they decide uh, of the reality of things. So we have to establish a system that could put law in the situation where it could be measured according to uh, a, a more general understanding of what the world is, really, nature. And he says, he uses a word there, and he uses a word in Greek. He doesn't speak Latin at that moment. He uses a Greek word to describe what the law needs to be saved from itself, because it's what it's, it's all about. you know. And this word is the word nomos. So the word that translates as you know, that was a norm or that translate, that translate rule or, or that translate uh, 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 regulation in, in Greek. And when I saw, I saw that, I said, okay, so what he wants indeed is some form of a replacement. And this claim, I mean, it's not simply a detail because this claim was a very powerful claim and a claim that actually created in in the Roman juridical world, a split between two major schools, one deciding that, of course, okay, Cicero is not wrong, maybe we should follow him, and indeed we need that kind of check imposed upon law so, so that, you know, uh, we, avoid, we avoid, we don't know what, but we avoid something that we don't want. And on the, on, on the other hand, someone said, well, it works very fine, why don't we need, what do we need, it's no more shit, you know, 
And, 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 but Cicero, you know, he was more persuasive, perhaps. So uh, he was closer to the, 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 the ears of the ones in power, whatever. So somehow it developed, developed, not so much within the confines of the, uh, the Roman world, but afterwards. Uh, and especially since, you know, the, 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 the Renaissance, where Cicero was, you know, all over the place and all the humanists coming back to Cicero started to develop these courses that, that were attuned to, to what is said. And what is important there indeed is the fact that the category of nomos is not a legal category, is not a juridical category, it's not a category that belongs to the world of law. When it arrived, when it, it started to, to, to be used by the Greeks themselves, it was quite late in the history of the Greek world, fifth century BC. Mm-hmm. And, and also it was quite a brutal shift or brutal decision. I mean, it was not part of the type of vocabulary that the, the Greeks were using, at, uh, you know, in the first centuries of, of the, of, say, and more than a few that first centuries, I mean, almost a millennium of the first, you know, uh, uh, let's say, moment of Greek civilization, when they would use words such as thesmos, for instance, which means somehow decision or retra, you mean somehow constitution, but rather than constitution, maybe it should be, well, constitution is not that much of a, of a, of a good translation for it because the constitution in, in our, you know, heads, you know, it comes with, you know, the constitutional, you know, either court or power and then a, a, a gathering and then a decision. Here it's, it's different. It's not something that comes and that will, that will then create a certain institutional setting for a society to live within. But it would be the opposite. So there's a moment, there's something, there's a society, a police, a, a city, and then what are the ground principles organizing the city? Given that, of course, through the definition of of the extraction of these principles, it's also possible to offer possibilities of reforms and so on and so forth, like Aristotle did, and Xenophon and others. But but you know, retra and 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 thesmos had nothing to do with this with the idea for instance of nomos and when the idea of nomos appeared it appeared like a footnote in both the texts of some philosopher like parmenides who was one of the first ones to use it or of authors of theater such as such as uh, Aeschylus or, or, or sophocles you know who, who who used it suddenly and we don't know why historians don't know why they don't explain it the specialists in this question they don't give a, a true explanation because they don't have any suddenly the word appears and ends up in the discourse and in the vocabulary of 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 uh, of Christinius, so one of the great reformers of, of athens and for the first time it enters let's say the political realm when a, when you know the definition of the, the greek notion of isonomia so the equality of everybody within the space of the police uh, uh, is proclaimed by uh, uh, Christinius as an as a way to appease conflicts between different social classes within within the city but it's it's the it's a, it's a, it's a category that really comes from philosophers first and that is developed and used and justified and formulated not only in parmenides but then in plato in aristotle always in the same kind of direction and the direction in question you know it's already present in this fragment of parmenides when he says okay it is necessary you know, it's a paraphrase, not exact quotation, but it's necessary that the human nomoi, so human laws or regulations, be structured as the divine nomoi. So it's in, there must be some kind of a parallelism of organization through the idea of nomos of the human world and the divine world. It's not to say that the, the human world should look at the divine world and and put the divine over the human, so on. So, no, it's really a parallelism. So, the way that the gods deal with their shit in their, you know, own realm, in their palaces or their clouds or whatever, wherever they they, they do their, their weird things, we should do a bit of the same. You know, we should do a little bit of the same. And the gesture here is very important because when we speak about human nomoi in such a framework, what already appears and what will be confirmed by either you know, the seniors, but all the other uses of the word nomos. And that's a big novelty of the word nomos. What enters into the picture is a shift in the perspective about, let's say, normativity in general. Suddenly, the question of normativity becomes a question pertaining to the general idea of an order, but an order which is not simply the order, you know, of the world as it is given, 
but the order of the management of the human group itself, the city itself, and so on and so forth. So the fact that rules had something to do, or decisions or whatever, had something to do with an order, uh, so with principles that will give to everybody its place within uh, the general framework of the city, it was not something that was part of the more ancient Greek reflections about law. So there was no need for an overarching order uh, for it to work. Simply, okay, something happens, well, we deal with what happens, and then we see, mm -hmm. and then we, okay. The fact that the Greeks went into great efforts in defining this order, so the old discussions that were, is, were very famous with the Greeks about cosmos and so on and so forth, they went into great efforts in discussing that for a very simple reason, which is the fact that in the Greek thought, and especially in the Greek philosophical thought, uh, the whole is also always more important than the parts, and the whole always precedes the parts uh, in this discussion about order that arrives and that, that develops in the 5th century uh, uh, before the present era. And this is something very weird. You know, it's the linguists who have shown that very convincingly. The fact that, for instance, uh, in, in, in Greek, the world uh, 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 politeia, so the city, the, 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 the citizenship, let's say, the, 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 uh, the, the group of citizens, so to speak, the city precedes historically and linguistically from the point of view of the derivation of language, the idea of the citizen itself. So the polites comes after the politeia which is, incidentally, is not the case for the Roman, where it's the opposite. I mean, there is first the, 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 uh, mm. uh, the kivis, and then the citizenship, you know, the kivitas, as a, as a grouping or as a university of, of, of the citizens arrives, arrives second. Um, the fact that there is this primacy, mm. and that this primacy is what governs the idea or the arrival on the, on the philosophical and theoretical and even legal scene of the idea of nomos, means... I mean, it's a gesture which is bold, very new, um, absolutely unique if you compare to other civilizations uh, at, the, at the same time, and which is at the same time something brilliant and genius and a catastrophe. A catastrophe from the point of view mm. of the possibility for law to work outside of the idea of order. And now we, because of the triumph of the idea of nomos, Ciceronian you know, vision of the rule linked to the idea of order, has having to govern and tame and domesticate the proliferation of, 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 of uh, juridical operations, the fact that we live in this world means that indeed we have, we, have, we have decided to render impossible a whole series of other explorations of the world or of, of connections between things or whatever uh, that the law understood as, as use, as recht, as, as the juridical, could help us to, 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 to perhaps envisage. So, um, yeah, this, this, was, this was indeed a very, very dramatic moment, and a moment which is absolutely contemporary to us. That's the thing. You know, it's, it's not simply legal history. It's not simply, uh, again, antiquities. It's, it's, it's really about the present because law is it's, it's like mathematics, and mathematics uh, has the same you know, age uh, as law from that perspective. You know, you still do mathematics with one plus one, you know, with the fir very first signs mm -hmm. uh, that were used for, for mathematics and arithmetics and then geometry. You still use them, even though they have been reviewed and revised and complexified and so on. And so, on. But it's the same with law. Um, we still live our everyday life with tools and instruments that were invented at that time, which make this conflict seemingly very foreign to us and, and pertaining to civilizations that have long vanished, a contemporary I wouldn't say a struggle, but that is a contemporary question and a question that I, I wanted with this book and, 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 and others, that I wanted to bring back, uh, let's say, front stage mm. as a way to reflect, as I said a minute ago, about the possibility and impossibilities that are left to uh, law uh, in, in our present uh, yeah, era. That's a, a, a brilliant overview. I want to ask another thing about the book, but on the opposite side of the coin. I heard you say in another interview that I'm sp speaking specifically now about writing styles. And you said that, you know, for you, the, uh, you know, like the medium is the message. The form is important for you. 
when you write. And I also liked in his blurb what Andreas Philippopoulos Melopoulos said. He he said your paragraphs are almost Twitterable. Is it also the case in in after law for you that you you matched the medium and the message? And what what is it, or or is it purely a pragmatic thing that you had to, given the grand scope of it, that you had to be to the point and punchy? Or? Well, there are different issues, I suppose. Um, um, first of all, indeed, there are you know when we write, we all have our um, you know obsessions, I suppose, and 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 mine includes. Uh, obsessions which which go as far as to literally count you know the number of 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 words in a sentence the number of sentences in a paragraph number of paragraph in a, you know so the, the whole thing is is actually measured and 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 then if you read after law so it's it's divided into in 10 sections divided in 10 uh, subsections every subsection is 2500 signs so it would be i don't know uh, I don't remember um, how to convert signs into words uh, suddenly, but uh, yeah. So it's and, and every sentence has the same length, uh, even though this, the, the, there are some punctuation tricks that make so that you don't realize it. Hopefully, because otherwise mm. it will start to be very very boring, I, I guess. But uh, 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 yeah, so there, there are these these, these kind of, of the form of framework that is behind it, which is very important for different reasons. It's important because I. I, I, I have a, I always have a vision, a material vision of the book when, when I start to write, and uh, and I love to create a form when I because I don't think or I don't believe, but it's a belief. Truly, I cannot justify it, but I don't believe in formless ideas, you know, in formless concepts. Um, I don't believe that mm. concepts or ideas exist outside. You know, in the world, and that we just can grasp them, and then we put them on paper. And no, I, I have the feeling that if you take the books out, simply it does not exist. So the form is a vital dimension of, of whatever mm. we say. So this this is one of the reasons why I yeah I, I take great care uh, in in measuring that and in conceiving the books as 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 forms. A second factor is the fact that I don't come from an English uh, or American um you know academic background it means that you know every word has its is its own rules and when you're a lawyer you will you know supposedly you will follow a certain type of rules but when you're an academic there are also some types of rules that you you want to follow and 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 i must confess that not only as an author but also as a publisher i i i i can't stand i can't stand the you know the standardized academic, you know, you know, Anglo-Saxon academic way of producing knowledge. So this 45 pages chapter that then you assemble in five or six or eight, and then you have your book. And then, the, you know, there's an introduction where you say, actually, everything that is interesting in the book is already in the introduction. And it starts with a personal anecdote that is absolutely uninteresting about, uh, you know, your, your, your childhood or what happened when you saw your, your baby eating uh, his or her <laughs> banana. And so then you realize, boof, oh, yes. And you started writing your book. Uh, and say, okay, why, why do we need to, to, you know, we know the power of storytelling and we know that publishers, mm -hmm. you know, they love that and they want you to speak about yourself and so on and so forth. Fine. But if you want to speak about, about yourself, at least have an interesting life, you know, uh, otherwise, come on. <laughs> um, so I don't come from this and I, and I, I don't like it, but I also don't like, you know, the French, uh, automatic, they, 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 the French have something different. Um, the French lawyers, you know, there is this rule, which is a rule which is written nowhere. But if you don't observe this rule, you absolutely you discard it the, the very minute you open your mouth to divide everything in two. So every work that you have must be divided mm -hmm. in two parts. And every every part should be divided into subparts, and the first part should should be uh, the, the the fourth part should answer the first part, and the second part should answer the, the, the and the third part should answer the second in in some kind of a, the dissertation model, you know, when you, you you're making your point and the point should be should be formalized like that. I, why? I don't know. I think it's the object itself, let's say, that has to 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 force you into inventing a form that will fit. Here, of course, mm -hmm. there's also the fact that I'm I'm theoretically asthmatic. You know, um, there, there, there are people who have you know big lungs and they could, they can go on and 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 describe broad landscape and i envy them i truly do uh, it's not ironical at all i truly do i i cannot do that i'm i'm i i'm attracted 
you know, uh, magnetically, you know, um, so it's a physical issue almost uh, to to the aphorism. So um, I, I I have to force myself into expanding things. Uh, even though I realize it is absurd to, 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 you know, we are doing research, right? We, we're not writing aphorism. So, yeah, there's this need to, uh, to expand as much, uh, as much as possible. And especially in this book, I wanted to, uh, to satisfy my, let's call it my, um, yeah, Agambanian urge or something, uh, you know, uh, the fact that I wanted to use lots of words from foreign languages, you know, <laughs> uh, everywhere, because there is an erotics to that. Mm. And and the erotics of, of knowledge, mm. um, you know, Foucault spoke a little bit about that, uh, but it's it's so important, it's so forgotten. It's not simply the erotics in, t- in pedagogical terms for the pleasure of reading, but it's also the erotics of the object itself. And I think that part of the thing that I wanted to do with the book was to try to, um, to, to, to say or to suggest or to let you know, the, the readers guess that the, 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 the sinister and sad and boring dimension linked to the appearance that lawyers give you know, of themselves, the type of language they use, the way they write, and, and so on and so forth, it's not a. It's not something fatal. It's not a destiny. It's not something. It's not something that that has to be. Mm. Um, there is a desirability behind that, and maybe it's because I hated it so much that I that when I started to scratch the surface and find the, the, the let's say the living cause, the thing that I found or I had a feeling that was the living core of law, that suddenly I said, okay, then if it's exciting well i have to render it exciting otherwise what's 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 the issue i have to at least to transmit the excitement that i had in discovering mm-hmm. these things that were cast aside that were left as as worthless you know properties as as yeah as trash and and to to to, to show you know the beauty mm-hmm. of of this trash actually so so yes it's part of what i'm trying to do with law these days and also also in my classes is to try to resurrect the unexpected, surprising, and you know sometimes brain twisting dimension of law. So, which is, yeah, let's say it's it's erotic if it, if it has any, of course, which can be, or, you know. But uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, maybe one of the intentions that are behind uh, behind these these formal choices. The erotics, which is, and I use the word, I've already used the word once. Uh, a few minutes ago, but it's it's high time that we realize again that we learn to consider again how crazy, how sick, how science fiction this is, really. And this is something that strikes me. And I'm I'm sorry if I repeat myself uh, compared to you know, but really this is something I, I the fact that the dead can do things in the world of law, the fact that time can be uh, uh, can go backwards in law. The fact that natural uh, bonds or natural filiation, for instance, in the case of adoption, can be ignored and other f- other forms of relationship can be built out of nothing. The fact that the law organizes coexistence, connections, and close relations with beings that don't even exist, such as companies, universities, uh, moral persons, or, or whatever. The fact that the law surrounds us with all these things that are absolutely not natural, so the natural law of Cicero, yeah, my ass, um, the fact that that mm. the, the law creates a world within which all that is possible, it is sick. It is absolutely, it's even absurd. And the fact that we try so, so desperately to make it pass for something gray, fundamentally gray and dull, is mm. the saddest thing I can think of. Uh, it's sad for the lawyers themselves because mm. I, I I wouldn't love to watch myself in the mirror every morning that when I go to to my office and say okay I'm doing some very dull and boring job and I'm dull and boring myself and I will prove it to the world again fruit and and then I I go to I take my Mercedes and and and, and I go to the you know oh uh, I I you know there's 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 some almost psychological or psychoanalytical paradox there. And, and and I'm not sure that it has been um, it has been yet completely grasped or or, or 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 dealt with and and yeah maybe maybe also it's the new bee you know kind of enthusiasm you know I was was not finding my way suddenly I found something and I'm oh I'm so excited uh, you know <laughs> I don't know but I think it's important.
No, but I think definitely you succeeded because immediately when when I started reading the book, I felt like, okay, this is there's something different going on here. Definitely, I think some of that excitement that you spoke about is definitely conveyed also in the formal aspects of the book. Now, where you ended with that question about the kind of science fiction of the law is interesting for me because in the Mesopotamian section of, of after law and the code of Hammurabi, you briefly draw some lines between law at the time and scientific thinking of the, that, uh, at the time. And, you know, this is a theme that, that I'm quite interested in. So I'm wondering, keeping that in mind and keeping like the, the Gunter Teubner quote also in mind, I think it's still relevant about this kind of, to what extent, this cultural, whether you want to call it an achievement or not, but this cr cultural creation is constantly in the background. What do you think has been the role of law in scientific knowledge creation, in our understanding of the world from a, from a scientific point of view or knowledge or truth, whatever you want to call it? Because I think most practicing lawyers would, and, and probably most practicing scientists would immediately reject that. I, I think there is something to that. And what I'm hearing from you is also, it, it sounds like uh, we're on the same page with this. Do you think that, and in what sense, has the law completely shaped our understanding, not only of society, but really of the world? Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's a heavy one. Uh, I'm not sure that I have a, a very satisfactory question to uh, answer to, to to that question, but the truth is, of course, first we have to divide between which law we are talking to. So, if we are talking from of, of law from the legal point of view, uh, it is indeed a fact that the whole idea of the normative, the whole idea of yeah, the laws of nature and so on and so forth, has, has played an immense role in development of of of, of uh, at least a discourse on on, on science uh, up to the very you know recent day. But if you take the um, and 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 because because of course the issue of normativity, the issue of necessity, uh, the issue of 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 of, uh, of the ought to be in general, you know, are all part of these this discussion. So science have the discour the discourses on science have have especially in modernity have very much revolved. Around the very idea of necessity, which is, uh, let's say, a byproduct of a certain idea of legality. So this is this is certainly the case. Um, but there's the other aspects. So the operational, the juridical aspect that I was talking to, the, let's say, the more Roman uh, uh, aspect to it, and there also somehow it played a role, or it could have played a role, or perhaps it will play a role, but a role which is which is more akin to some sort of of, of pragmatism, let's say, uh, uh, and a, a pragmatism that uh, pragmatism, you know, in the you know, Jamesian perhaps sense or even fire Arbentian sense, if you like, uh, uh, namely uh, an art of uh, exploring possible consequences. So on the one hand, you have the realm of of rules to observe. Uh, or the observation of rules as governing a certain functioning of the world, and on the other hand, you have the the operations through which you can envisage, you know, the explorations of fields or domains that you don't know anything about. So both maybe are part of the thing, but uh, can, can you know lead or, 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 or yeah can 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 be seen as participating to different layers in the history of of science. But I, I believe that. This is an endeavor that should be made someday, you know, a, a, a legal or juridical history of science. That would be something interesting to, to write. Um, you know, I myself, I'm trying not in the field of science because I'm unfortunately not, 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 I do not consider myself an expert in anything, but especially not in science. But let's say that I've done it in several other aspects and other, you know, books that are not translated into, uh, into English. But I'm always trying to see in a given topic no, let's say, for instance, the invention of, of, of the modern subjects, modern subjectivity, you know, this is a discourse that I've been you know, used time and again, and up to, up to the very present, you know, you know the, the personal, how do you call that, the uh, self-help movement and so on. And, and I've tried to, to, to show that contrary to what is always said, 
the modern subject was not an invention of, let's say, liberal states or the invention of, of some form of philosophical modernity, such as, uh, 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 you know, the role played by the, Descartes or Locke and others in, into shaping the idea of the self, the idea of the I, or the idea of, of, of the subject and so on and so forth. But that was forgotten in this history of the development of the subject was the fact that, as Locke himself had recognized uh, in this famous definition of the person that he gives uh, in, his, uh, in his essay, which is the fact that person, he says, is a term that comes from uh, the world of forensics. And forensics in, that in, in, in the time he wrote was the world of law and the world of the bar, to be precise, or the world of advocacy and so on and so forth. So when we speak mm -hmm. about the, 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 the appearance on the philosophical scene of the figure of the person or the subject and so on and so forth, actually, we're speaking of the return of a juridical figure. So when we speak about individualism, we're not speaking about mm -hmm. psychology or sociology, we're speaking about law. So we have to redo or to reopen the category of the subject to see why it is not simply a philosophical category, but also a, uh, either juridical or legal category. What does it mean? You know, and it's the same. We can do the same with, you know, mm -hmm. lots of uh, different concepts of, or ideas that are treated by the history of, of philosophy or the, the history of human sciences as something that simply goes out from the dictionary, you know, at some point, which is defined, but whose underlying program, you know, the underlying, let's say, norms of will or desires that are behind it are suddenly forgotten. And the fact that these, most of these ideas are technical terms that come from the world, that come from the world of law is something which is completely overlooked. So the, literally to look at basically everything or anything with the lens of either the legal or juridical history creates effects that are always surprising you know i do that not because i when i do it precisely i do it also not in an exploratory manner you know i have the feeling that there's something that i don't like for instance i don't like self-help you know books so i want to write something on self-help so mm. what i'm what am i going to do with that so i uh, say okay self-help the person to self i look in books you know uh, uh, I, I i looked at books belonging to this movement and, and and I saw, you know, the question of okay, the, the self and the the I, okay, but, but where does it come from? And then, and and then suddenly there's there's this this encounter in Locke, and suddenly everything falls into place because indeed the question of the subject is not the question of the emancipation the emancipation of the human being, but the question of its normation into a certain position. So the the very idea of the subject becomes the the prison from which we try to mm -hmm. escape through the idea of the subject, which is completely absurd or a paradox, or a paradox, right? And and, uh, and then you can do that with mm. lots of you know uh, different things. I, I think about this one because I, I have uh, a book of mine on the topic just in front of my eyes. But um, but indeed, and, and for science, I would be very curious to see that um, to, to 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 see what were the, also where the connections uh, between you know the actors. You know, at some point, I, I even tried to commission to a legal historian, mm. a very a true legal historian, and not a legal historian, but a true legal historian. Uh, I, I wanted to commission him for one of my series, uh, uh, precisely a cultural history of law. So not a history of rules, not a history of institutions, mm. uh, but a history precisely of persons, what they do, their connections with, I don't know, artists, writers, uh, uh, scientists, um, the way the, the legal vocabulary suddenly, you know, permeated at some point within this or that milieu or realm and so on and so forth. This is something that would be, I, I, it would reveal, I'm sure it would reveal extraordinary and unexpected um, uh, effects. So, um, so yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm on the same page as you. Simply, I, except for this, you know, broad declaration, I, I've not done the job myself and, 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 mm -hmm. and I could not simply to, to go back to the example that you gave, that you, you gave out of my book. So the, the Mesopotamian example, the Babylonian example is indeed it's a quite fascinating one because it becomes a question because the question is a question of structure and of linguistic structure. And the fact that the, mm -hmm. the, all these ancient texts had a structure in, I don't know how you translate that into English, uh, because I, I should open it and, and see what the translator has done with that by the way before. but uh, but it's it's this structure in, in you know protasis and apodosis when you have this first part that says if and then you have the second part that said then you know the necessary the necessary mm. 
it's again the idea of the necessity. So the necessary mm. the necessary consequence for a certain state of affair is to be expected, and so on and so forth. So all these rules in the Amurabi Code and others say, okay, if uh, uh, you steal a, a sheep, uh, then you will be punished by having your hand cut. And what is fascinating there is the fact that the necessity mm-hmm. is formulated not on the conditional, but on the future, and the you know the indicative future. So if it will necessarily mm-hmm. happen, it will happen. It's not that it could happen; that it will happen. Mm-hmm. And indeed, the, the experts in the mm-hmm. history of Mesopotamia have, have shown and have have, have 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 proven that. I mean, I've really, it has been a discussion, but it's now established that this linguistic structure that these codes borrowed. They borrowed it from the scientific treatises of the time. But the problem, or the funny thing, is that the scientific mm. treatises of the time were what? Well, the prophecies. So the, 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 the epitome or the, the, mm. the, the highest level of, of Mesopotamian science was the science to indeed predict the future, uh, to interpret the signs and to take from the signs, you know, the possible interpretation of what, what is going to happen now that we see that happening. So... Actually, the rules, these codes that were not caused by any stretch, but what, you know, that have been called by codes by, by some historians at the end of the 19th century, actually, they were simply the records of a set of prophecies made by, you know, the highest scientists of the time, namely the king, you know. And, and this is something which is, which is quite amazing mm-hmm. and, and funny because this structure, we still use it. <laughs> we're still somehow making prophecies. And when Oliver Wendell yeah. Holmes says that what should be the study of law, you know, in this famous discourse, The Path of the Law in, in 1892, if I remember it, read correctly, when he says to the students of Boston University, what should be the object of the study of law? And you have this Bostonian, you know, Brahmin, very serious saying to them, well, precisely the study of those prophecies that we call judgments or that we call jurisprudence or, and so on and so forth. So maybe in his, in his for him, it was... Mm. Obvious. It was obvious also because it was very familiar to all the anthropological research and historical research at the time. You know, Fraser, uh, Moss in France, uh, and all all these uh, 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 scientists who precisely were very interested and very busy with magic uh, in ancient societies or magic in other societies and what it is. Magic. You know, magic is not spells and and and, and potions and filters. No, magic is question of performance and of effects mm. how do you make so that words have an effect so mm. here there's a, a, some kind of a continuum which is quite funny between you know ancient you know mesopotamia and and oliver Wendell holmes and the birth of legal realism has the birth of legal m- magicism if you'd like or magism. so the realization that actually mm. is about some sort mm. of, of of effective uh magic and i, I love to use that because because of course we, we never think of anything you know if we think of law we never think of law as, having, uh, as having anything magic to it uh, but but especially literally speaking mm. uh, but I, I love the fact that that this uh, the, the, there is something there that, that's still that is still also uh, among us so to speak so does that mean that you are to law as the magician who gives out all the secrets to the tricks to the public who reveals the <laughs> well are they uh, uh yeah I, 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 I well, wait well maybe <laughs> well that's a good one you know you know what i've uh, of course there's always the idea that when you reveal the trick is very disappointing um and, and there's there's also this you know there's it's almost, almost a popular assumption you know when oh no don't tell the trick because when the trick will, will be revealed um uh, uh, uh suddenly all the magic will be gone Personally, I must confess that I've always found this assumption to be absolutely false. I mean, when the trick is revealed, the true problem arises, which is how did he do that so that I did? Mm. And then suddenly you can start to admire really the person. You know, mm. when you, you see, uh, I don't know, David Blaine mm. doing some sleet of hand in front of you on the table. You know, you're there, you have the nose on it and you know that there is a trick. And even if you know mm. the trick, how? And the question of the how, that's the question of right. the juridical. That's not the question of the legal. The question of the legal is also about why, you know? And when you say why, say because of that. And if it's because of that, then, well, you can do this, but you cannot do that. But if, if the question becomes a question of how, the question of how can also always metabolize into, but 
how and how this and how that uh, why not this and oh, no, not why no. how, how can I say it in, in English so that it makes it makes some sense but the fact that a how always calls for the possibility of an, another how if we do it that way we can also do it mm. another way and 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 then produce something which was not expected so the question mm. of the how compared to the question of the how is a mm. question that opens so to speak and 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 that's why yeah revealing the tricks uh shouldn't be uh, shouldn't give us a reason to uh suddenly s be disappointed and sit and say oh oh it was only that no no that's where you know the true game uh, mm. begins well hopefully we spoke now about law and science now i want to substitute science off the field and bring on uh philosophy and maybe talk a little bit about your book uh, Deleuze's philosophy of law which like I said it just came out in English but uh I think you wrote it originally yeah, was it 10 years ago eight it was or... published in 2009 okay so a little bit more than 10 years ago so sorry for uh you probably have to dig very deep into your <laughs> memory now to to talk about this book again but Deleuze makes this very clear uh, distinction between the law and philosophy and then in a I, yeah i don't want to sp spoil the ending of the book but the the very surprising thing about it is that in the split again philosophy is the one that comes worse off in law now we're, we're trapped in, in this english vocabulary but the law comes out comes out looking better after Deleuze has yeah. cut them up. Um, do you mind just explaining yeah, that a sure, little bit? Sure, um, uh, sure. It's, and, you know, the, the encounter with, with Deleuze and was also one of those whoa moments, you know, at, at, the, at, at, uh, at the end of 1990s and the beginning of the, 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 the 2000s again, I was, I was more into um, uh, whatever was prohibited by my law professors to read. So it was... You know, so I was reading Bourdieu and Baudrillard and Derrida and, and Lacan. And, but I didn't click with Deleuze until the moment when, of course, I started to work with Isabelle Sengers and Bruno Latour. Isabelle Sengers is maybe the greatest living Deleuzean. Uh, it's so very sad that she's not more famous in the Anglo-Saxon world because she's just immense. And, 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 and I started to reread Deleuze. And to read the books of Deleuze that I had not read also, you know, I, I had read a few before, you know, What is Philosophy, uh, Anti-Oedipus, uh, a few others. But I started to read it, to, to read Deleuze systematically. And I bumped into this chapter in the middle of the introduction that Deleuze gave to, uh, to uh, Sacher Mazor, uh, Venus in Furs. And there's this small paragraph or two pages where suddenly he starts a very small history of what he calls the image of law and simultaneously because for him it's simultaneous the, the, the history of also the, 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 cr the critique of this image and the critique which is almost immediately embedded into the image itself and I read that and I reread it and for some obscure reason I don't remember why I was invited to give a talk at some seminar in Paris uh, organized by friends and I decided to talk about that and I tried to got a few, a little bit more material around this distinction. And I realized that there was something quite systematic. And actually Deleuze is always very systematic when you know, so you, there's, there's all these flourishes of languages, images, sometimes craziness, especially in his books with uh, Félix Guattari. But when you read how the paragraphs are made, the arguments and so on, it's always very, very, very systematic. So I started to see the systematicity of it. And then with bits and pieces from other books, the system went bigger. And I did. I give this talk, and someone after this talk said, "Okay, you have developed a very interesting, yeah, yeah, the critique of Deleuze is quite fascinating. What what he says in terms of the construction of the history of, of law, but there's also all the aspects, you know, the praise of jurisprudence, of case law, and so on. What he says about you know English law, we make something of it and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot to look at this, and I went back, and to much to my surprise, and really, I've, it's, it's, it was absolutely not something that I wanted. It's something that I simply saw so appear in front of my eyes when I gathered the, the materials because I simply did that. You know, I went into the books, I took all the sentences where he was speaking about law in one form or uh, another, I put them all in a file and I put them into 
the order that I have the fe- I had the feeling that Deleuze was him, himself, you know, uh, presenting. Even though the books, the, the the quotes were scattered all over his work, his work from the 1950s to the the, 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 the early 1990s. And I realized that yeah, all the jurisprudence thing started to answer the critique and image of law, a history of law that he had did in either presentation of Sacher Mazor, but also in, in all of his texts, you know, in the Kafka texts, in, in his texts on, on, on Bartleby, in all the other places. And then both were very systematic, both were very historical. So they had a history, they were telling a history, a reverse history, as a matter of fact, and both could be literally divided into, yes, a critique of law, and also what I, sh- I have to call a clinique of law, because that's the title also of a book of Deleuze. And there's this kind of distinction between critique and clinique that it, it was really uh, um, doing. So a history of, of law from the pre-Socratics, from the very origin of law, from the pre-law, uh, as he called it, borrowing from a legal historian of, of, of his time, up to, uh, let's say, modernity. And then all the way back, uh, indeed, to 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 the Romans, and it was so. It was extraordinary because Deleuze was the only one from his generation. You know, if you say you know Foucault and Derrida and Lyotard, all these French, you know, all the French theory guys, or Althusser and all the others, but not only them, but also their their friends all over you know all over the world. You know, the critical legal studies in in the US or in the UK. Uh, uh, um, the Italians, uh, from I don't know, from Negri to all the others and so on. Despite the, the fact that in Italy, you know, Negri or Gamben, for instance, did law school, so they were they actually they are lawyers and not philosophers. But anyway, uh, but also, mm-hmm. you know, over the place. Compared to them, he was the only one to when you know all the pieces went together. The only one presenting an, an image or portrayal of law that was at the same time very critical of a certain vision of law, but also hugely almost ecstatic about law understood precisely in operational terms understood in its possibilities explore, exploratory or, 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 or almost laboratory like laboratory like you know dimension so i would say that everything that i've been trying to do myself was basically to add a few footnotes to this very small book where i simply try to make sense out of that that and and the, the chapter from latour that i that i mentioned earlier and and try to bring some legal historical material to to these intuitions uh, that literally I I found almost naked in front of the eye of everybody, but that nobody, for reasons that you know that are mysterious to me now, uh, but you know, in retrospect, n- nobody had cared to look for. You know, with Deleuze, it's always about I don't know deterritorialization, the event, mm-hmm. and and the body without organs and whatnot. Mm. Sure, or the, the three syntheses of time and, and all very important issues. But it's very funny to see that the small bits and pieces were, are often, you know, they're also left aside and, and cast aside. And again, maybe that because I've I've an inclination mm. to trash. I don't know. I, I you know I go and 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 see them. And this was indeed the first book that I did on Deleuze. I've done three others that are not translated into English. So there's a they're all very small uh, books. And I did the same, you know, on the concept of pop philosophy mm. that appears, depending on how you read it, three or four times in his entire uh, oeuvre, but always at strategic places and, and with very powerful claims surrounding it. I also did one on uh, the idea of control, where I, I went backwards, meaning that um, I went from Deleuze to Burroughs and I reconstructed Burroughs' uh, theory of control to understand why, actually, well, Deleuze had completely misunderstood it, and maybe it's the weakest part in the the entire oeuvre of Deleuze is the postscript on society of control is maybe the, the 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 less interesting thing that he has ever written, and why, and then you have to to go back and see why Burroughs was doing something extraordinary with the idea of control, or rather the idea of the limits of control that Deleuze, uh, uh, reading Foucault, was not wanting to uh, perhaps to, to to grasp and the last one uh, that i did that's not out yet in french but will be out probably next year is about this very small sentence deleuze had in the letter to um, to michel cressol his famous letter to this severe critique where he says disappointing is a pleasure and mm. this sentence for me has always you know mm. 
it embeds an entire ethics. The disappointing is a pleasure. So I've wrote, I've read this, I've wrote, written this book, which is called mm. Disappointing is a Pleasure, uh, th that will be uh, eventually out in 2023. And for me, this is uh, my Deleuzian so tetralogy, if I, if I may say so, because I will probably not, uh, uh, because I'm not very mm. much fond of commentaries of uh, philosophers. Um, um, it's, not, it's not my, it's, it's very funny to do, but it's, it's, it's not what I want to do, let's say. Uh, but Deleuze, every time I, I, I en encounter mm. one of these forgotten bits of sentence somewhere or reference, he always opens up so crazy possibilities and possibilities that are so often, let's put it clearly, you know, so often un mm. you know, overlooked or, for, for, or forgotten or even despised by Deleuzeans themselves who have become their own worst enemy uh, in that respect. But the guy, I mean, it's always, it's always surprising. The guy, he has an entire philosophy of law hidden in bits, but like that, you know, like, mm. like if it was a hobby or something, but uh, an important hobby, as, as you, as you know, uh, Deleuze said, said it is himself to, to Claire Parnay, you know, if, if, if I hadn't been a philosopher, I probably would have, uh, become a lawyer. He said it explicitly, would have studied law. Mm. And this, this, this has somehow remained mm. throughout his entire career, this kind of interest for law, but from a point of view which is operational. It's not the law mm. of, let's say, the institutions to which the Marxi mm. that the Marxists, like had to say, will, will attack. Um, it's not the law as this theater of violence mm. that Derrida will attack. Uh, it's not the law as a system of discourse and speech that Lyotard will attack. It's not the law as a symbolic system that Lacan will attack. It's not the law as an homogeneous field like Bourdieu will, will attack. Or the law as a system of discourse where, with embedded fascism like, like Roland Barthes will attack, for instance. Uh, it's different. It's another law uh, that is underlying and which is the law that has the possibility to, to indeed produce consequences as Deleuze himself being a pragmatist. I mean, it was what he was obviously interested in is how can we build consequences that are interesting, meaning that they can produce themselves other consequences. Um, how can we mm -hmm. go the path of, of the production of, of, of consequences? And this is what he wanted for philosophy and that for him, philosophy was unable to achieve, mm -hmm. but law was. So um, yeah, that's the most unexpected praise of law coming from someone of a generation where law was absolutely mm. the enemy to, to shoot at. I, like I said in my question, I found that really surprising and, you know, a pleasant surprise getting, getting a, a philosophy of law that, I mean, it, sh it should be critical 99% of the time, but this one time that it wasn't completely critical was, was kind of nice. I think I've taken up so much of your time. So yeah, it was really nice. And, and, and thank you for writing these books. Um, well, thank you for reading them, <laughs> you know.